Hopping is entering the audio interface market with the two channel E2X2 interface. And in this video, we'll check if it's a viable option compared to offerings from established brands. Hey, Julian Kraus here. And with me, I got the Topping Professional E2X2 audio interface. Some people might already know Topping from their hi-fi products as they have been producing DAX and amps for a while now. An audio interface has not yet been in their repertoire, but this has just changed and I want to see if the E2X2 can deliver similar performance as their DAX. Full disclaimer, I bought the E2X2 with my own money, period. Let's move on and dive right in and I mean that quite literally. Let's see what the hardware has to offer before we're taking a look at the audio performance. From the outside, the E2X2 looks pretty much like any of your typical two-channel audio interface. On the front, you can find two XLR and TRS combo jacks, accepting mic, line and instrument signals. For each channel, you also have a gain dial and separate phantom power line level slash instrument switches and direct monitoring buttons. Further to the right, you can find a level meter, which shows you the inputs as well as the output levels. I really like the level meter, it's simple but effective. You can also control the brightness of the level meter in the software, and if the power LED were dimmable as well, then that would have been the topping on the cake. Icing, I mean. By the way, the software also has some features up its sleeve, and we'll get to that later in the video. You get three more knobs, a main volume dial, a mix dial for direct monitoring, and a headphone volume dial. Of course, there's also a quarter inch headphone jack connection, which in its performance is unlike anything else I've ever seen from an audio interface so far. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Another thing that I haven't seen on any other audio interface I tested is a gain button. This lets you toggle the gain of the headphone output and this way noise and volume range is optimized. If you don't have such a button and use sensitive IEMs, you might only be able to turn up the volume dial to a third before your IEMs get uncomfortably loud. Unlike with normal headphones where you might be able to use the whole volume range. Also the noise should be lower when listening with IEMs as they make the noise of headphone amps much more apparent. With over ear headphones the noise of the headphone amp is much less of an issue. So when you enable the gain button the output is increased by 17 dB, which is great for hard to drive headphones, and if the gain button is disabled, the maximum output level is lowered, but this also increases a signal to noise ratio and you still have plenty of power for IEMs. I really like this feature as it enables optimal performance and usability with a wide range of headphones. The backside of the interface is really not that interesting. You get two balanced quarter inch TRS outputs and the interface has a USB-C connection to hook it up to a PC. Although two additional things here, one is a second USB-C connection for powering the interface in case the host device does not provide enough power via the first connection. And there's a flippin' power switch. I know it's quite weird to get excited about this, but I'm personally a big fan of power switches on interfaces, as I might only use the interface now and then for recording, and when it's not in use I can simply turn it off. Alright, of course I couldn't help myself and took apart the interface. The analog to digital and digital to analog conversion is all done by one mystery chip. And I say that because the label has been lasered off. Not quite sure what topping is hiding here and we can't be certain of the exact chip, but if I had to guess I would say it's an AKM AK4621 codec. I say this because its performance pretty much matches all the measured performance and number of in and outputs. I could be wrong though, but that doesn't matter because the only thing that counts is the audio quality as a whole and we will definitely have a look at this later in the video. All in all, I would say the build quality is okay, the housing is out of metal, but only the top and front is thicker. The sidewalls are pretty thin and feel a bit flimsy. One bigger point of critique are the ergonomics. The main volume mix and headphone volume dial are so close together that you get your finger stuck between them when doing bigger volume adjustments. So you have to revert back to the trusty old crab walk method of incrementally adjusting your dials and that's really finicky. As a quick hack you can just pull off the cap from the mix knob and that gives your fingers much more room. I know it won't look great but it works. Regardless, I would really like to see an improvement here on future versions. On the note of dials, in my testing I noticed that the gain dials of the mic inputs are exponential and that means that in the last 15% of the gain dial it cramps in about 20 dBs. So when you turn up the gain, the level changes only slowly in the beginning, but then towards the top the gain shoots off. This can make it really quite challenging to set your gain correctly with dynamic microphones as with them you will be close to the maximum gain and then just slightly touching the gain dial adjusts the gain by a couple of dBs. 
and there also seems to be a spot on the gain dial where you can hear a slight scratching noise when adjusting the gain. So in terms of usability, I think there is room for improvement. Enough about the hardware, I guess you want to see how the E2X2 performs in terms of audio performance, and as this is an audio interface, let's check out the mic inputs first. Frequency response is of course the first thing to look at, and this is quite interesting. As you can see, with the gain at the maximum setting, it has a noticeable roll-off in the higher frequencies, which even creeps into the audible range. While I don't expect this to be very obvious under real-world conditions, because dynamic microphones mostly have a roll-off at higher frequencies as well, but in an A-B comparison, this is definitely audible, leaving you with a tad less openness. When you use less gain, which is very common with condenser microphones, then the frequency response is actually much better being nearly completely flat in the audible range. No complaints here. Dynamic range is also quite important, especially with condenser mics, as you typically want to leave yourself some headroom while recording without introducing additional noise. In my measurement, the E2X2 performs really well with 116.7 dBA, which is already more than you would likely ever need. This is even slightly better than a Focusrite 4A for a fourth gen and the well-known Moto M2. Distortion is also negligible. In my measurements, you can see that it starts to level out at about minus 105 dB, which is, in my opinion, already way below the threshold of audibility. If you use dynamic microphones, you want the interface to have as little preamp noise as possible to get a good clean recording. Here, the E2X2 performs really well with an EIN of minus 131 dB UA weighted. This is pushing the limits of what's physically possible to achieve and it's right up there with the best measuring interfaces in terms of preamp noise. To demonstrate that, here's how the noise compares to a few other interfaces. I have amplified the recordings equally in post so that you can hear the noise more clearly. One more test I usually do is to let you listen to the noise with an SM7B connected. This mic is pretty much a worst case scenario for any preamp and generally a noisy microphone, but here's how it fares being plugged straight into the E2X2. As mentioned, it hardly gets any better than that, and for the remaining noise you hear, you should definitely blame the SM7B for its ridiculously low output. By the way, the noise of the E2X2 is pretty much the same of that of a cloud lifter or fat header, and that means there is literally no benefit in using these devices with the E2X2 in terms of preamp noise. So that's quite nice. What is not so nice though is the input impedance of the mic input with only 900 ohms. This can start to affect the frequency response of dynamic microphones, and here you have an example for that. This is the difference of the same mic plugged into the E2X2 and another interface with a more typical input impedance of 3 kilo ohms. Now arguably the difference is only a dB, so nothing crazy, but with other microphones it might even be a bit more. And I think for a company that strives for technical perfection, 900 ohms on the mic input is a bit too low. The line inputs are pretty similar to the mic inputs, so I'll just quickly glance over them. The frequency response is very flat as expected, because with line level signals the gain is usually set quite low and there the E2X2 has no issues at all. Perfectly fine. Dynamic range is the same as the mic inputs with 116.7 dBA, and as mentioned before, this is excellent and it's unlikely you'll ever need more. Distortion performance is once again really quite impressive, with only inaudible amounts of distortion at minus 105 dB below the test signal, and the line input can also take a maximum level of 22 dBV, which is a proper professional line level territory. Okay, jumping to the main outputs on the back, they have a virtually flat frequency response in the audible range. Not much more to say, then that's excellent. In terms of dynamic range, the outputs can deliver about 115 dBA, which is really, really good. And because of that, under normal circumstances, there's really no chance that you hear any noise from the main outputs. That said, you can see that similarly priced interfaces have already surpassed that, and they are pushing more towards 120 dBA. Again, do you really need that? I doubt it, but I was a bit surprised as topping is usually pushing these kind of things to the limit on their DAX. Distortion performance is excellent and with distortion sitting around 100 decibels below the test signal, 
there is hardly any chance you perceive any distortion. But again, I've already measured slightly better performances from similarly priced interfaces, so while overall the audio quality of the main outputs is great, I would have expected slightly more purely from a technical aspect. The headphone output might probably be the most exciting part of the E2X2. In this eyesore of a table you can see how the interface compares to pretty much all other interfaces I've measured so far. The colors give you a rough indication on how the interface performs and it is pretty much all green. There are of course two rows here, one set of measurements is for the low gain setting and the other one for the high gain setting. Frequency response performance is excellent, I don't expect anything different today. And same goes for the high gain setting, nice and flat in the audible range. Output impedance is something I quite often criticize on other interfaces because when it's too high then it can affect the sound especially when using low impedance headphones. But the E2X2 has about 1 ohm so all good here. The power output is something I have not yet seen on any other audio interface, especially one that is just powered by USB. This really puts pretty much all other interfaces to shame in the power department. And the E2X2 will have no problems driving even power hungry headphones to loud listening levels. At the same time distortions are kept very low. You can see that here in the THDN vs power graph. Regardless of low or high gain mode and low or high impedance headphones, the distortion components are always kept at around minus 100 dB, which for all intents and purposes is inaudible. In the noise department, the E2X2 breaks my records again with ultra low noise levels, which means that even with sensitive IEMs, there is pretty much no way you will ever hear any noise from the headphone output. Did I already mention the word impressive yet? Channel balance and crosstalk were also very good, no complaints here. Yeah, I don't have anything else to say about the headphone output, the numbers speak for themselves. And I'm very positively surprised by this. This resembles more the performance of a dedicated headphone amp than an interface headphone output. Okay, let's have a quick look at the software, as this seems to be mandatory in order to use the E2X2. On my Windows PC, the interface was only recognized once I installed the software. Regardless, the software does quite a lot of things. Up and foremost, it lets you control quite a lot of functions of the interface directly in the software, like turning on direct monitoring, toggling phantom power or phase inversion. Important thing to mention is you cannot set the gain of the mic inputs remotely, you can only do that with the analog dials on the interface. But in the software you can add up to 20 decibels of additional digital gain, which in some situations can come in handy. The software also offers loopback, so you can record what is played back on your PC in addition to your mic inputs. And for that you can even set up a dedicated mix. The mixes are set up on the right hand side and you have a total of three mixes which can also be assigned to the output. One thing to keep in mind is that while you have multiple mixes available, you can only have the same assigned to your headphone and main outputs. You can mute one or the other with just a simple click of the button, which is nice, but you cannot have a different mix for the headphones and the main outs. At the very top you can set things like sample rate and buffer size and the software allows you to save your mixing setup to be quickly recalled later, which I think is really handy. The last thing to mention is that you can scale the whole UI to your liking, which I personally quite like, because some applications can be really quite tiny on 4K screens. And in the settings is also where you control the brightness of the level meter that I mentioned in the beginning of the video. The change in brightness is not that big, but the option is there. I did encounter one bug in the software, which is where I could not update the software itself via the search for updates button. I clicked on it and then the software is simply closed but the new update was never installed. So if you want to do the update you have to go to the website and download the newest version manually. Not a big deal and I've already reported this to Topping and I'm confident that they can fix that because they've already made multiple changes in the software to improve it. Last thing before closing this video is latency. The direct monitoring is done digitally and naturally this adds a some amount of latency which also depends on the set sample rate. But this was never really worse than 0.5 milliseconds, which I would consider to be real time as you cannot perceive this short amount of delay. Round trip latency is the time that it takes an interface to output a signal and then record it again. This is important for when you want to monitor your audio with effects applied in your door in real time, for example an AmpSim. Here you can see that the times vary quite a bit depending on the set sample rate. With 48 kHz the RTL is a bit on the slower side, 4 to 6 milliseconds is usually what I measure with the lower buffer sizes. But the times do improve with faster sample rates and at 192 kHz it has caught up and is now decent. 
Now, I think we are all a bit spoiled by the technical performance of topping decks, as they are quite often state of the art in the measurements that I've seen. If you were hoping to see this here as well, then you might be a bit disappointed. Now, don't get me wrong, the performance of the E2X2 is excellent in most measurements. It's just not pushing the boundaries as much as I would have liked it to. At least that's true for the inputs and main output. Now, in terms of headphone output, the E2X2 does push boundaries though, which is really refreshing to see. The headphone output impedance is very low, as it should be, and distortions are at an inaudible level. Noise is exceptionally low, and there should be no chance that you hear any noise, even with sensitive IEMs. If that wasn't enough, the power output is really good, and with the exception of a few esoteric headphones, you should have no trouble driving pretty much any headphone to really loud listening levels. One area I'm less happy with is the ergonomics and usability of the hardware. As mentioned in the beginning, the gain of the mic input ramps up quite sharply, making it tricky to set your gain correctly. The potentiometers also have a spot where they make a slight scratching noise when adjusting the gain, and the volume and mix dials are definitely too close together. The mic input frequency response at the maximum gain setting and mic input impedance could have also been a bit better, not that this hugely matters in practice, but I was a bit surprised by this as all the other measurements are so much better. In the limited time I was testing the interface I cannot make any statements about longevity and usually this is not a huge deal as interfaces tend to last quite a long time. But I have to mention that Topping had some noteworthy issues with quality control in the past. One time one of the headphone amps had a flaw where when it would fail it would apparently also kill the connected headphones. A recently released power amplifier had a lot of failed devices due to overheating components and I experienced an issue myself with my PA3S amplifier where one of the inputs simply stopped working. So if Topping wants to really be seen as a professional company and as a true alternative to established brands, then they have to get their quality control right. I think that's important to keep in mind. Check the comments as I will keep you up to date in case anything happens to my E2X2. Generally speaking, I think the Topping E2X2 is a good interface with some shortcomings in ergonomics. The audio performance is excellent and I think the biggest selling point of the interface is the immensely capable headphone output. So if you are searching for an audio interface that amongst other things works well with IEMs and power hungry headphones, I think the E2X2 is well worth a look. Alright, please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe for more and I will see you all in the next one.